Welcome back to the Done Deal Show with the Dean Machine Jones. How are you, mate? How are you? I'm good, mate. Yeah, it's a pretty busy start to a transfer window, isn't it? I said last week, like, what's the point of a, a, an opening day? I think the point was, we've, we've seen it already. People were ready. They were ready to go. Uh, and we've got action from the first moment. So, yeah, Mason Mount, yeah, Kai Havertz, Barella, like, there's big stories. It's a massive story. On the show today, we're talking them. We're talking Madison. We're talking the Rice Bid, City Hijack. Um, we will touch on Harry Kane as well, because Dean, first in the business last week, to get it absolutely spot on, that it was impossible that Man United were going to get Kane. Within a week, Man United have completely pulled away from the deal. There's lots to talk about. There's lot, uh, West Ham's, um, of course, we know of, uh, ahead of time have rejected the bid, but that isn't the important piece of news. We'll look at why, what's coming next, City's involvement as well. So stay with the Football Terrace on the Done Deal Show with Dean Jones this morning. Please make sure like buttons are hit and you've turned on the bell notification so you know when we go live over this Summer. Um, I wanted to start with, with Manchester United this morning, Dean, because the bid, we know a bid of £40 million has been made for um, Mason Mount. That has been rejected as of right now. But what's your understanding about the next steps for Manchester United? Are they likely to come back? And if so, what, what does that bid look like? Yeah, I think they're likely to come back. Um, my question is, when will they come back? How quickly... Will Man United want to revise this bid or will they want to leave this and let Chelsea sit on it for a minute? Obviously, if they were to let them sit on it, you risk the chance that another team comes in and, and slightly inflates the offer and, and you start getting into a bit of a battle. But at the same time, you do want to unsettle Chelsea a little bit here. And Man United don't want Chelsea to feel like they are in control of this situation because, quite frankly, Chelsea aren't in control of this situation anymore. Um, they decided that Mason Mount was worth... 200,000 and something a week. Um, not the 280,000 pounds that some other players were, were getting and new signings were getting. So they set out there that they had a certain valuation of Mason Mount. And that's fine. But you can't then go and value that player. He's got a year left as 70 million pounds, right? Yeah. That's the predicament that they're in. I don't believe anyone is going to pay 70 million pounds for Mason Mount. And I think for Man United to, they've let their intent be known straight away, like 40 million pound. This is where we're at. You can see we're serious. Mason Mount knew we were going to do this. Like the terms are fine with Mason Mount. We know we can get the player. Everything else is sorted here. What are you going to do here? And that's the situation that Chelsea have to now weigh up because if this lingers, Chelsea might have a bit of a panic up at some point because they don't want to be getting to pre season. And Mason Mount is like, oh, right, it's pre-season training. Am I coming? Am I invited? Like, yes. what what happens here? So it's in Chelsea's best interest that, that the Mason Mount deal is sorted out quickly. They need to move on from it. They've made it pretty clear that if he's not signing the contract they've put in front of him, then he needs to be sold. But at the same time, you know, you've got a new manager there who's trying to build something new. Chelsea got a list of 10 to 12 players that they're trying to offload. What if they're all hanging around at the start of pre-season? It's going to be an absolute mess. I believe that Chelsea are going to bounce back stronger next season. I mean, obviously it can't be much worse than it was. <laughs> but but they do need to like get their ducks in a row quite early. And I think Man United know that. I think, I think that that's why they've gone in so soon with a reasonable offer, but one that they wouldn't have accept, expected to be accepted because they will negotiate this. I mean, what I believe, I mean, I've spoken to a few people about the, where they think this will go. I think it will settle out about £50 million. Pound. And I think at £50 million, pound, Chelsea then got a decision to make because is he really... Like, they think they can get to 60. They, they think clubs will come in at 60. They're setting it at 70, hoping they get 60. I mean, United the other way. They start at 40, hoping they get him for 50 or under. And I, th I think 50 is think 50 fair. I think, I think that, is, that is a price that, if it's not going above that, get, puts Chelsea in a position where they're eventually going to have to say yes. I, I think you're absolutely spot on. And, and what's really key here, Premier League fixtures were announced today. It's two months until it kicks off. However, it's only about three, three and a half weeks until teams are back for pre-season training. Man United's first pre-season game is the, the, the early part of July. You typically typically do at least one week's training before, before your first preseason game. I'm sure Chelsea's is somewhere in and around that same ballpark, sort of 
you know, not anywhere between the 9th and the 15th of July will be the first preseason game. So they don't have Chelsea a long period of time to, because the season ended so much later than normal this year, they don't have a, a prolonged period of time to negotiate. We're obviously going to move on to Kai Havertz later, but mm. players that need to move out. There's lots of clubs interested, but I feel like all the buying clubs are essentially sitting back and saying, we're not going to pay you what you want for these individuals because you're in a desperate state to deflate this squad. You also need to add talent. And it's difficult for Chelsea to add talent until people leave. So something's got to give. I get a feeling that Man United will come back pretty soon. Maybe look at, you know, 40, anywhere between 45 and 50 million as a bid. Yeah. Just to see where, you know, whether they get a, that's hard it, no it, yeah. or, or a hard no or a or a considered no. Okay, well, we bid 48 million. It, it took two days to get the no back. I'm just making this up now. They know that they're pretty much near where City, Chelsea, sorry, are ready to um, uh, uh, sort of accept. And look, it's it's a really interesting thing when it comes to Mason Mount. We said it last week. Lots of fans unhappy about it from a Man United perspective. But so many top managers, so many big teams in football are interested in this guy. So it's definitely one to watch. It, it, staying with Man United, we, we know now, as you told us last week, the Kane deal was impossible. It isn't going to happen. Man United have now briefed the media and said, we, you know, we're, we're pulling away. We're not even going to make a bid. It's it's a futile pursuit. Who do Man United turn to now from a striker point of view uh, to bolster those ranks? Yeah, I mean, this is the this is the toughest uh, moment for them, really, to see where they can can turn. I mean, you've got your top tier players. You've got you've got Harry Kane, who's obviously the 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 big dream. That would definitely be the case. And then you've got um, Aussie men or Vlavic. I think Vlavic might become a potential. Um, there's nothing there yet, but I feel that Vlavic is one of the few that, that could go in there and, and have that similar impact to what Kane could. Like, he's not quite at Kane's level, but he's got the potential to get there. In the past, he's been compared to Holland and stuff. He's the sort of striker that you'd want going head-to-head -head with him in Manchester. But then you've got like the second tier of players to consider. Look, Rasmus Hoyland is, is definitely one that United really like. Um, he's attainable at a decent fee too. I, I think that there's a strong chance they do it. What we also need to consider, if they're not going to do a, a Kane-style £90 million transfer, do United look at actually trying to get two? Do they look at getting Hoyland plus another? What sort of value can they find in the market? And how can they strengthen that front line to give them more goal options next season? You saw in the FA Cup final, like United are just blunt. This, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's just a huge problem. And it's, you know, even if you don't know much about football, you can watch that game and be like, they're, they're quite a good team, but why haven't they got somebody who can score goals? Like it's a, it's a very basic part. Like Marcus Rashford has, has told Ten Hag, he, he's kind of ready to try and become a nine if he wants him to be. He's, he's happy to, to take on that burden and his shoulders of the responsibility. I don't think it's the way forward personally. I think no. that you would, you're, you're taking too much away from him. And I've said before, like, while well, Veghorst obviously isn't a, a clinical goal scorer, one thing he did bring to Man United, one thing he did improve about Man United was Rashford's output. So Veghorst's movement often allowed Rashford to exploit spaces. So it was one of the things like seen or unseen that, that um, Veghorst brought to United that was positive. Hoyland can make similar movements to that. And he's, he's a very smart footballer. And I think that United like that, that vision. And I think that finding someone that could certainly help Rashford improve is, is one path that they would go down. But also, yeah, somebody like Vlavic doesn't look like he'll be that expensive. And, and it's, it's seeming like Juventus might actually might actually sell him. So if, if he's available, I think you've got to go and do it. And why not try and get two? Benjamin Sesko has always been somebody that United have liked. It's gonna like he's just joined a new club. It's extremely hard to do. But yeah. it, it's one that was always talked to me as like, well, they would get him, but they would also get somebody else. And it just it's just always lingering in my mind that United now might be tempted to go and find, sign two forwards because ultimately they just don't have enough there. If there's no Mason Greenwood, if you can't trust Martial to be there, if Vegos isn't going to be around anymore anyway, if Rashford isn't going to be the number nine, you've literally got nobody. You know, I literally don't have a number nine and it's, it's, it's not good enough, is it? No, it, it isn't. And it's a, it was an area where if you look at even the, the, the FA Cup final, City were the better team, deserved winners. But if Man United actually had... If you actually had Vlahovic and Hoyland as part of our team and squad on the day, 
we would have had a much better chance of of winning. It, 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 cold hard light a day. Martial out of the game injured. Veghorst coming on just impotent. And look, Rashford does an okay job as a number nine, but okay isn't good enough for Man United. He is a top class inside forward. That's his best position. And as you say, with a an out and out number nine, someone that knows the position, makes the right runs, who we had to come centrally, <coughs> excuse me, and score goals. But you want him out wide, using his pace in those areas. His hold up play is okay. You know, he's yeah. okay through the middle. But as I said, okay is not good enough for Manchester United. So it is a certain area. Um, there's uh, a lot of viewers are talking about uh, uh, his name eludes me, the young man uh, from Frankfurt. Oh, Kalamani, yeah. Kalamani. I mean, I, I look at his number. I, technically, when I watch him, good. I look at his numbers and I, he doesn't stand out as being overly prolific. And the money I see it's going to cost to bring him in. Personally, I, I sort of, I'd rather sign Tony and wait so till expensive. January. But yeah, he's so expensive for what he, he, the kind of money they're looking to charge, you would expect outputs like a Harry Kane, but they're not there. Uh, him, Latoro Martinez, there's a few other names that the viewers here are mentioning. What are you saying? Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with you on Kalimani. Like, he's obviously, like, he's really, really good. And to be honest, he is actually a really good fit for Man United too, and he's a proper goal scorer. It's just that he's so expensive and Premier League unproven. That is a risk. Like, Man United will also be considering, just because they're not going for Harry Kane now, doesn't mean they wouldn't try and get Harry Kane in a year. Mm. So if they did get Hoyland now, and could find a way to get through this season. Like, what are Man United's actual expectations for the next season? Does Ten Hag genuinely feel that Man United are going to go and win the title next season? Does he think they're going to win the Champions League next season? Or, or is next season another stepping stone towards making sure they've got more trophies under their belt and they've, they're more in that conversation? And then the season after that is more realistic as a title-challenging season. And is it plausible that when Harry Kane becomes a free agent in one year's time, that that's when Man United go and get their big number nine and he's the missing piece and they're ready to go? That That is going to be an option that's on the table. Like Harry Kane's going to have his pick of clubs in a year's time. Yeah. He's not leaving right now. And United will believe that they're in with a shout of it and they'll just be hoping that by then Mbappe's joined Real Madrid and that Haaland's staying at Man City and they'll hope all these other things are in place at that moment in time. But you don't know. But... um yeah, I certainly feel Lautaro Martinez. There hasn't actually been any any contact there. They they admire him, but yeah, um, I think the thing that's most interesting about Lautaro Martinez is he has a desire to come to the Premier League now. Yeah. So there aren't that many places for him to end up. And Man United and Chelsea is, is two that he quite fancies. And I think the Chelsea one has been played up to me a little stronger than the Man United link. But okay. yeah, that um, makes sense. that's where. Yeah. In terms of one other United player before we move on to Tottenham, Chelsea, Arsenal today, Kim Min Jae. A lot of reports from Italy, United have agreed personal terms, and the deal looks like it's proceeding. The German press now are saying Bayern Munich have entered the race and they're proceeding things well. What's your understanding of, 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 the, of the pursuit of Kim Min Jae um, and, and what you're hearing in terms of where his next destination may be? Honestly, that. Bayern Munich have been linked with a lot of players that they're not getting at the moment, aren't they? Um, they were massively supposed to be in for Declan Rice, which was never happening. Massively in for Harry Kane, which was never happening. So it's it's quite interesting. I would take this one a bit more seriously than those two. I'd, I'd go as far as saying that I believe that that Bayern would be a more plausible rival for a player like Kim. Um, so I, I would take that seriously. Um, but, you know... Kim is in a situation where he's um, not signing a new contract with, with Napoli um, and Man United have made inroads to um, understanding what his aspirations are. And it's believed that um, if he had his pick of clubs, he would pick Man United. Now, obviously, Man United are in a situation whereby they, one, have this small window to make that move at a decent fee. So that's going to that's gonna be upcoming in a few weeks. But secondly, they've, they've still got defenders in their squad that they need to make sure that they're confident are going to be offloaded. Now, I'm not saying like United have to get rid of Maguire before they could do this, but I think they'd want to be sure that like... They're gonna, yeah, they're going to move on. and there's, Yeah, there's going to be a domino effect happening that means that they're not left with like too many players. Um, but yeah, I, I think Kim's definitely a plausible option for Man United. He's he's a very, very would be a very good addition to the team. Um, I'm not going to get carried away and say it's done, but I think that yeah, there have been positive signs so far. 
Thank you very much. Uh, viewers, make sure like buttons are hit. Make sure you're subscribing and bell notifications are turned on. Uh, Tottenham, uh, an interesting headline. And I had to check with you before we went live that you had said this because I didn't want to uh, put it out there. But Tottenham Hotspur and not Newcastle United, uh, supposedly now favourites to sign James Madison. Uh, last week it was Newcastle. Now it's Tottenham. Not you changing your mind, by the way. This is the first <laughs> time you've reported on it. But uh, what's the latest there? Yeah, I think I might have alluded to this last week on the show. I, I was trying to remember where I first said it. it might have been on here, actually, but only in passing. Um, but yeah, look, Tottenham um, have had an interest in James Madison for a long time, as we know. Um, you know, they've got their new manager in place now, and he's very much on board with the addition of, of, of James Madison. And my personal understanding of it is that the people that will be being used to, to do the deal have good connections with Tottenham, which could give them an edge in this conversation. Now, that's um, been backed up by a couple of people that I've spoken to in the last week, and they just feel that like Tottenham are in a very good position to go and get this done at 55, 60 million pounds if they want to go and do it. Now, part of the problem here is James Madison isn't the actual priority for them. Like they, they need a goalkeeper, they need a centre back. Like those are Tottenham's big problems. But they do also want someone creative to come in and James Madison fits the bill and he's available. And this is the this is the problem. Because he's so readily available, anybody could come along at any moment and pay £55 million for him and, and they'll get him. So Tottenham don't want to get caught short in that sense. Newcastle don't want to go as high as £60 million on James Madison. Um, so that might hold them back if Tottenham were to be willing to do that. Newcastle are also being offered so many players like daily they're being <laughs> offered players and they're having to wait up like even today coming into this show uh you sent me a tweet where, where Kulusevski is being offered to to Newcastle um to go and join them like this is every day there's a new name being mentioned for Newcastle at a time when Newcastle were trying to brief that they're not going to spend more than 75 million pound um so that that's that none of that really fits in either but I think Newcastle and Tottenham are going to be in for a lot of the same level players now, to be honest. So I think this is probably something that's going to be uh, quite a constant going forward. Um, but yeah, James Madison, only a slight edge, I would say. I don't think there's a lot in this. I would just say that Tottenham probably more willing uh, to do the deal that would be needed here. And I think that they're better equipped to get it done if they do want to go ahead with it. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one, as you say. And that Newcastle do have that Champions League football, but Tottenham are probably still right now perceived as a as a bigger club by some people, although the project at Newcastle is amazing. But they've got to be careful. As you say, they're being offered all these players. Some of it will come to fruition. Some of it will not. But you need to make sure you're not bringing people in where agents are thinking, right, we might be able to get a better payday here. Rather, you know, you want people that are really bought into what you're doing and the stage that you're at. The Barella situation, obviously, last night, the kind of way it was worded by the Telegraph, like it was they were closing in to this £50 million pound deal for him. Is that quite as it seems for Newcastle and Barella? I don't think there's been a £50 million pound, like firm offer on the table here. I mean, that's... Look, I, I was caught out. I was blindsided by it a little bit. I mean, there has been talk about Barella, but there's been talk about a lot of players going into Newcastle. Um, and there was interest. My, my feeling around Barella has always been like, this is a player I can just not see leaving into Milan. Like, and if it's going to happen, it's going to take a lot of money and it's got to be an ideal club for him. Um, so it was obviously being played up. And from the Newcastle end of things, it wasn't being knocked down. Like, there was a def definite, like, without going as far as yet, we've made an offer. It was like, yeah, definitely we're keen on this uh, and progressing this. From the Italian end of things, everything's been very sceptical. They don't believe that there's been an, uh, a firm offer made. They certainly don't believe that that fifty million pound would be enough to land Barella. So you start asking around. Okay, if Barella was to move, like what's going to be needed? And seventy million pound, I think, before you could even have the conversation, is is the gist of what's come back to me in the hours since this story broke. Mm. So we have to wait and see whether that's the case. As I say, I don't personally believe that Inter would be willing to let Barella leave unless they absolutely had to. I mean, it depends really the extent of the clear out that Inter Milan need to have we're always reading and hearing about the fact that they're in financial disarray but you know Onana, Bastoni, Barella, Lautaro what's happening with Romelu Lukaku 
um, DiMarco, the left back. Like that's half their team. This is a team that just got to a Champions League final. We're going to let half of them leave. Like, I can't see that happening. Yeah, I hear you. So I think that that's part of the problem here. Um, but Newcastle, yeah, look, there's a there's something in it. They definitely like Barella and would like to explore that option. Whether Barella's desire is to go and leave Inter Milan for Newcastle United, I'm not so sure. And whether they can actually come up with the funds needed, I'm not so sure. Because like I mentioned a minute ago, Newcastle were trying to set out that they've got a budget of £75 million. But they've got like five spots in the first team they want to strengthen. So... Yeah, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't fit. Up, it doesn't add up at all what New, what Newcastle were briefing. The, I think Newcastle were doing what... I believe they're doing what Man United are doing. We don't have much money. Man United said that last year. Every journalist was like 100 million, 100 million max for United. Spent 205, 210. They've definitely got more than 75 million. New shirt sponsor, Champions League money. Get out of here. Like, they'll advertise. Yeah. They, they, they're not stupid. You know, they're going to be absolutely fine. There's no doubt. I'm sure... They're getting new spot, more new sponsors now. They're in the Champions League as well. So, yeah, it's, it's one to watch. But Barella, yeah, I agree with you. I'm not playing down the, the way the story read last night. Oh, wow, this looks amazing. It's kind of been debunked a little bit by a lot of journalists since that maybe things aren't as far along. I think the president of Inter has also come out and said we're not selling him, especially not for 50 million. Pa- Look, if Declan Rice mm-hmm. is going for nearly 100 million, there's no way Inter are letting Barella leave uh, for yeah. more than half that. It's it's absolutely. Um, Crazy. Uh, viewers, keep hitting that like button for us. Make sure you're subscribing to the Terrace. Um, it's, it's hard to know who to go on to next, Chelsea or Arsenal, because I feel like they're kind of so intertwined at the minute. But I wanted to start with the Kai Havertz deal, if possible, because Arsenal are working on the deal. Chelsea are wanting £75 million for him, but the reports are Arsenal are not willing to go as high as £60 million. Of course, we've been told that the player is up for the move uh, to the Emirates Stadium. What's your understanding of this situation and this almost bombshell story that broke yesterday? Yeah, I mean, there had obviously been whispers of this uh, before. I know you've given uh, credit to Alex Goldberg for that. Um, sometimes I think it's important that, you, like you say, you give credit to people who are not established ITK guys who get information and uh, it turns out to be true. Um, it does happen. Um, there's not only two transfer guys in the whole world that hear things like there's hundreds of people that hear things. Um, but it's, it's just the consistency of it that gets you to, to where you end up. I think in terms of Kai Havertz, I think there's a difference between like, can it happen and will it happen? I think that's the, probably the situation, um, and my reading of it at the moment, he does really like the idea of working with Arteta um like if there are any concerns from his end about like uh what's going on at Arsenal whether it would fit him uh, I'm sure it wouldn't be too too difficult to get in touch with Jorginho and find out from him like whether he should follow follow him whether or Jorginho staying or not he could definitely guide him I'm slightly surprised that Pochettino isn't ready to embrace Kai Havertz but at the same time I feel like the environment hasn't been good for Kai Havertz and I think that that's where a lot of this is coming from too. I think that Chelsea showing an openness to moving him on is only feeding the doubt that Havertz had about whether this was actually the right place for him to be at this stage of his career anyway. Now, as we move forward and we get into a situation where Arsenal have to weigh up a bid or not, I think we also have to consider that Bayern Munich are going to be keeping an eye on this. It's been played down quite a bit in the German media. They're like, there's nothing to see here at the moment. And I'm sure that that's true. I'm, I'm not saying that Bayern have actually made any inroads. But Havertz and Tuchel are on the same page here. Like, these are two people that get on. It's two people that share the same football philosophy. And, yeah, if if Havertz becomes available, then I'd be amazed if Bayern haven't at least checked out the circumstances around it and whether it could be done because he would be brilliant at Bayern Munich. Their biggest problem is that he's not quite the number nine that they want. He's more the Thomas Muller that yeah. Bayern would be looking for in terms of like just at that role rather than being the out and out Lewandowski. Like, but they need they're going to need both. Like they need Lewandowski's replacement right now. They're going to need the next Thomas Muller soon, and he is the guy that would best suit it in my eyes. So. Interesting to see with Bayern Munich coming into the picture. I think that Arsenal have money. I think that they're showing that right now. Um, again, it would be come down to structuring of a deal and how much they would be willing to pay and how they would work it out. But 
I love the fact that Arsenal were just testing Chelsea out. Uh, you know, they've done it loads of loads of people of recent years have made that that short journey from Chelsea to Arsenal. And a lot of times it hasn't worked out. I actually I actually think Havertz and Arsenal might be good. Now it seems weird because in terms of looking at the system, Kai Havert, Havertz doesn't have an obvious position to play in the Arsenal team. Like I don't know exactly where you would slot him. No, I agree with that. But if you look at him in terms of the technical traits and his personality and the way that he might bounce off of Arteta and the rest of that team and the way that they've been built to play, he's such a smart footballer. His little movements are so good. His ball control is absolutely ludicrous and just takes the level of that team up another notch. So, yeah, I think it's a good. I think it would be a good signing. I think they obviously have to focus on Declan Rice for now. Often teams go after two or three players at the same time. I think that's difficult to do when they're of a, a status of, of these players that they're now chasing. But what a turnaround for Arsenal. You know, a couple of years ago, shopping around like the French sale aisles, like where are we heading here? Like we've got no European football. We don't know where we're supposed to be. All of a sudden, you're taking Declan Rice, pretty much the best midfielder in, in the Premier League. You're going to look at taking Kai Havertz, who's talked about as a future potential Ballon d'Or winner when he joined Chelsea, trying to take him away from your rivals. And like what I would say is, is probably most impressive is everything you're seeing about Arsenal is about the here and now. This isn't about planning three, four years down the line. This is about like, we've got an opportunity and let's seize it. And going after players like Kai Havertz absolutely is fitting with that. I need to ask you, I want to get your opinion on this, Ben. You don't, I know you, you use Twitter a little bit and obviously you come on the, U, the YouTube channels, you, but you're not in the kind of fan sphere as much as, no. as myself. Most Arsenal fans that I interact with are just like Man United fans were with, with uh, Man United fans were with um, Mount, are kind of infuriated by being linked to, to, to Kai Havertz. But again, there was loose links yesterday to City being interested in Kai Havertz. I don't remember which journalist it was that said that. I want to say it was Ornstein, but mm. I, I may be wrong. We're obviously going to get into Pep also now looking at, at Rice, another player that there's a lot of people out there that don't think is very good. Mason Mount wanted by Klopp, by, po uh, by, by Poch, by, by Ten Hag. The best managers in the world want those players. What is it that you think, what, what is it that makes football fans not rate them, but the best football managers in the world do? I think a lot of it just comes down to um, body language. I think it comes down to um, the environment that they land in at a certain time um, and how they're judged in those moments. So for Kai Havertz, like the time that he's been at Chelsea, it's been a roller coaster what he's been through like the different the different setups that he's had to play in the different players he's had around him there's really been no consistency to any of it and for a player like him i think that that's really difficult he's he's still so young that he he needs to have a more settled side around him so that he can grow like there are there are two versions of kai havertz there's the german kai havertz that we've seen in the bundesliga that you see uh, in the national team and it's brilliant you see the Premier League version of Kai Havertz. And I understand why people were like, he ain't that good. He's good. He, you, know, you can see he's good, but he's not that good. Mm. You haven't unlocked him. That's why. You have not unlocked Kai Havertz. You haven't played him in his right position enough times. You haven't got the right people around him often enough. And you also, for well, the last year anyway, haven't had that consistency of, of performance levels to, to get the best out of him. So I think it's a mixture of all those things, really. Um, Kai Havertz... Honestly, anyone you speak to that's in the coaching game or recruitment game thinks that he can be. I saw someone laugh in the comments when I said potential Ballon d'Or winner. They're like, potential what? Um, he was. He's been talked about since the age of 17, 18, 19, coming through into elite adult football as having the potential to be a Ballon d'Or winner one day. And that's what we were looking at when he was making his move away from Leverkusen and making sure that he stayed on a good enough path to make sure he got to where he could one day be. So far, the path doesn't look like he chose the right one. Chelsea hasn't been the best place for him. Look, it doesn't look like it's going to be the case either. It's a massive summer for Kai Havertz. And it seems to me that he's decided that he has to move to get things back on track. Yeah, it looks that way. And I just, 
there was, there was, I, want, I want to read you a, a, a tweet from earlier on today, right? And this is just from a football fan, someone I follow. And he wasn't talking about Arsenal or anything like this, but I, I, the sentiment's there. <laughs> and he said, um, I've been, this is a fan. I've been watching this team, Man United, way longer than Eric Ten Hag. So we, so we've been watching. So we, the fans, have been watching this team longer than Eric Ten Hag. So we know this team better than him. And are we getting to a point where where fans with no football qualifications, as much as their opinions are valid, my, my whole channel was built upon listening to the opinions of fans. Sometimes I just sit there and think to myself, I don't understand. I'm questioning myself here because I'm not overly excited about Mount coming to Man United. So I'm in that category. I'm just stepping outside of it for a minute to ask questions, which is my job. There must be something we're missing that professionals see. And as much as we think we have the best palette. We have the best understanding. We had it last year where the Chelsea fan came on here. Roy, I hope you're good, Roy, if you're watching. And he said, I have a better talent ID. Now, this guy, I think, is a trainee accountant. He did go on countdown, actually. He's brilliant with maths. He's actually a math magician. You say, like, 232 times 379 to him, and he give, gives you the answer instantly. <laughs> but he said his talent ID for football players is better than Thomas Tuchel. Do you think fans are getting a little bit, to quote the great, Stormzy, a little bit too big for our boots. <laughs> I think a little bit, yeah. I, th I think Twitter's sent people, um, given people egos around the game that uh, has never been possible in the past and you've never been able to air your views and opinions so publicly and try to build your own little fan base of people who actually do believe that you do know more than Ten Hag or any other manager. But I think what you have to consider is like, okay, so even if you watch... All of 38 of Man United's league games across the season, you've seen 38 90 minute performances, and that's what you're judging on, right? Ten Hag, within two months of being Man United manager and training with the players every single day for three, three hours, four hours, has seen more, he's seen more of those players in six weeks to two months than you're seeing across an entire season. And you're seeing them in totally different environments. He's getting to know their personalities. He's getting to know their actual roles and like the backgrounds behind the people and what they actually want to be as a footballer. And that's what Ten Hag also really focuses on, understanding a player's mindset and like their family life and like all the things that go into like a player's dip in form. Like he'll get deep into that. So I understand it. Like you can see it and you can judge Scott McTominay and Fred for what you see. But... If you were to go uh, to United's training ground every single day across a season and get to know these people and see the intricacies of their play and actually how how their football mind works, you'd see a completely different. You'd see well, it from a completely different view. There's a comment here that says, "Why can't fans have better talent?" ID. I'm not saying some fans can't. My view is this: that legitimately, if you're sitting on Twitter today, if you're sitting watching this show, and you believe you you can spot better talent than Ten Hag, Two Cool Pep. Klopp, put your money, go and go and apply for a job because you know how much money you'll get. I guarantee you, you learn a lot more money doing being a scout for a football club than you will doing whatever you're doing right now, nine to five, like the rest of us. Yeah. Go and do it. Go and put it's... your money where your mouth, like, listen, fans should always be entitled to have opinions, but sometimes I just think it edges onto the side of what, what you, uh, someone actually said to me yesterday, football fans know more about players than scouts do. And again, you make you watch the games. How often are you at training? How often are you meet in these play? Like, there's just things you're not cut that you you just don't have access to. So I do think there's an element there. A mm -hmm. good comment here from uh, Guna Duke, who says, "Look at uh, how Odegaard is doing. Touted young talent, lost his way. Uh, Jacka transformed last season. Uh, can Arteta do the same with Kai Havertz?" And yeah, that's that's the big question. And and I I, I would say this to Chelsea fans: the fear inside you, the small fear inside you, should be. What if what if Mount and Kai Havertz go to United and Arsenal respectively and start to kill it? I'm not being funny. KDB is another standout example of a player deemed a flop in the Premier League, went away or went to another club, came back brilliant. Mo Salah flopped at Chelsea, left, came back, now a Liverpool and Premier League legend. Same numbers, almost, mm. as yeah. uh, game by game as Thierry Henry. Not as good, but in numbers are matching Thierry Henry's. There, there are there are occasions where it works out like that. Sancho's linked to a move to Tottenham. I part of me wants him to leave Man United, but I yeah. don't want him going to a direct Premier League rival, a team that's 
Because if he comes alive, hmm. there's an embarrassment to that when you let someone go and they kill it. Look what happened yeah. when Lukaku left, went to Inter, killed it. There was a lot of Man United fans for about until he joined rejoined Chelsea and it kind of went wrong again. We're like, oh my god, have we let have we let a god a, a, a god yeah. go here? But look, it's going to be very very interesting to see how this kind of progresses in the coming days, weeks, and months. In terms of Chelsea, we know they missed out on uh, Yagate. Caicedo still high on the list. I heard Onana, the midfielder, mentioned yesterday. What, what are they doing at the moment in terms of recruitment coming in, Dean? And I called you Ben earlier, by the way. I apologise, Dean. Oh, Sorry. It is Dean. So I didn't hear you. Um, what are they doing in terms of recruitment? Well, what they're doing in terms of recruitment, obviously, is is trying to sign players who are young, extremely talented, have big potential, but also have big resale values. And that is a, obviously a good part, a good uh, vision to have. But it's a long way from the Chelsea that built an empire. Chelsea didn't used to build teams like this. Chelsea used to build teams to go and win the Premier League next season. That was what was important to them. It wasn't about, oh, Carney uh, Chumalmeke, he's, he's good. Uh, let's sign him for like £20 million, pounds, whatever it was, because in a few years, he might be worth 60 Chelsea would have been like, let's go and sign this player for £50 million because he's going to win us the Premier League next season. Mm. I don't know that this Chelsea team... Well, I think... Basically, the, the clearest way you can probably describe what's happening at Chelsea is the identity of the football club has been completely ripped apart and they've lost all relatability from the fan base to what they had on the pitch. So it's all gone now. And they're making sure of that by by getting rid of all the players right now that they're getting rid of. Losing Kante, Kovacic, Mount, even Ruben Loftus-Cheek. Like, that's like the, the core of Chelsea's midfield. Like, that is the... You're taking so much experience away from the squad there by taking those four players out of your squad. And okay, like you stick Caicedo in there. If they do get Caicedo, look, in a foot in football terms, like 21 years old, like technically brilliant and actually really well suited to the role that you might want alongside Enzo. I, I understand that. Like that from that side of things, it's good. In terms of like where he's at in his progression as a professional footballer Caicedo's had one year of Premier League football at Brighton and you're paying 70 million pounds for him this is a guy they bought two years ago for four million pounds so this is a completely different version of Chelsea and it's just being proven like Todd Bowley spent billions of pounds uh buying Chelsea in the first place with his investment team then He's got in there and spent over £600 million on players. They finished in the bottom half of the Premier League. They haven't got a goal scorer still. They're ripping apart their team. Let's say 10 to 12 players ready to leave this summer. And all the ones that they're looking at, and they've signed over the last year, most of them, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. It's a great philosophy if you're building for that three, four, five year future. But what's happening next year? They've got a good manager in Pochettino. But he's got to have some players for the here and now. So if they sign Caicedo, which they are in a decent position to do, you know, I think they will accelerate that. I just think, well, what are you backing that up with? Because Kante, even though he didn't hasn't played many games recently, still massively important. Kovacic, really important player. Mount has been too, weighed in with big goals. Loftus Cheek, big part of the environment at Chelsea's training ground. Conor Gallagher, I don't think will end up leaving, but like the fact he's even talked about leaving, like, well, he's a young player of your own. He's like Chelsea mm -hmm. through and through. It's just a really strange way of trying to rebuild because so much is dependent on the future. And like, what if the next year is not successful? There is no future because yeah. you're not going to be in the Champions League again. And you're not going to progress to the levels that you need to get to to even keep this bunch happy, let alone entice Harry Kane or Mbappe to come and join you in a year's time. So I'm fascinated, really, by what this Chelsea um, hierarchy are doing with the club because it's massively brave and bold. Um, but... Yeah, it's risky. It's really risky. Well, I think it's like you go back... Ten days ago, it looked like wow that they're closing in on on Ugarte. It was very close, and then they're going to go straight in for Caicedo. And it was right; they're going to bring people in and then move people out. Now you're seeing them rejecting bids for the players they want to leave. Loftus Cheeks to AC Milan has kind of slowed down, and 
and somewhat fallen through. They're asking for a lot more money than people are willing to pay for their players. They've not got anybody signed and over the line yet. And I know that the transfer window opened yesterday. I understand that. But like we've already said, Potts needs to work with these players pre-season. Pre-season starting in like three weeks. So it's not about when the window opens, when the window shuts per se. It's Potch needs a pre-season where the squad is, in the next three weeks, they've got to get rid of five or six players and have a couple coming in and have the rest of them on a timeline out. You, As you say, you can't have 10 players going on your pre-season tour being part of your games who may not be starting your first Premier League game of the season. It's I've seen Man United do that. I've seen us take players on pre-season that the manager didn't want, the new signings haven't come in yet, and you start the new season flat-footed and it makes it difficult for you. And yeah. it's just imperative that Chelsea just go, do you know what? Okay, we're going to lose 10 million on Mount or 20 million that we wanted on Kai and 10 million here. But you put yourself in this, in this vulnerable position. It looked good 10 days ago. You haven't been able to pull these deals off. So something's got to start to give soon. And maybe there'll yeah. be a bit of a domino effect. You know, if Mount goes for 48 million, 50 million, at least it kind of sets a, a precedent of the valuation and, and it kind of moves everything else along quickly. But I, I keep saying this to people that it isn't two months until the season starts for the clubs. For us as get fans, that's when it kicks off. But for them, yeah. the new season starts in three weeks when preseason begins. And they've got to start moving things along quickly, Chelsea. They, they they really, really do. In terms of strikers, do you know who they're looking at? Look, it's all over the place at the moment in terms of like who they could actually get in. I mean, I think the dream is is Victor Ozyman. I I do believe that that is the, the one that would solve so much for Chelsea and they've definitely got an interest there. Just think it's very unclear as to whether there's any chance of that happening at the moment. Like Napoli's message is that it won't. He's got a massive valuation on his head um, that I, I'm not convinced Chelsea will, will go to right now, but if they don't do it, then I'm really, really torn as to like what I can can actually see happening. They've obviously got the Lukaku conversation happening. Um, I don't think it's ideal either way. Um, I feel sorry for Lukaku. I just feel like he's always the victim um, of, of any situation. I felt sorry for him in the Champions League final, to be honest with you. Um, I didn't think that... Um, it should all have been on him. Lautaro missed an equally good chance, to be honest with you. Not by, barely anything was talked about the, chance, the opportunity he missed in that game. Um, and Lautaro is, you know, talked about as a potential Chelsea signing. So yeah, I think uh, Aussie men is is one that that they would like. Um, Rasmus Hoyland, like I just don't think is a good fit for the here and now. I think if Chelsea are going to have a number nine, it's got to be someone that is so confident that they're going to be the 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 answer to this situation because they've been they have spent so many years like struggling with number nines it's become crippling to be honest like you know Aubameyang can't score goals Lukaku can't score goals Morata couldn't score goals Torres couldn't score however far you want to go back like Chelsea number nines just can't score goals so what whoever comes in has to have that elite mentality whereby they are completely completely set in their own ways and understand that they are going to be the answer to the solution. That's either the rawness of a player that um, has not had enough bad moments in his career yet to understand that things can actually go wrong and you go and sign a 20 year old yeah. or it's like an Aussie man who's just like complete elite mentality. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's such a difficult one, as you say. And again, I think the striker market, it needs something to give somewhere. It needs a player, whether it is a Hoyland to United, a Ramos, you know, United go for Vlahovic. It almost needs to be a marker set in the ground to go, right, this is what's going on and happening. But we'll be certainly watching uh, that space with you. A super chat here says, hi, guys. Terry, you're right about fans. Uh, we mostly overreact. However, we're not blind. Mason Mount isn't good enough to catch up to City. I'm sorry. I understand that. And I don't think if Man United just signed Mason Mount this summer, we're going to catch Man City. It's part of a wider project and plan, though. However, I will say this to fans. Last summer, everybody said, Lissandro Martinez, too small, will take us backwards. As an example, a lot of Man United fans last summer said, sell Rashford to PSG. He's finished. He'll never score over 20 goals in a season again for us. He scored 30. You know, this is a lot of Man United fans last year said, Donny van der Beek, under this manager, is going to cook. He is going to show you all levels. He didn't. So... There are lots of examples of people that say, say fans say things and they also get wrong. I'm not saying you can't have that opinion. I'm just stating don't show your ass and go all out madness straight away when there's multiple managers that want this individual. Plus, 
if United just signed Mason Mount, big issue. But if he's part of a very good summer of recruitment that includes, listen, I'm just going to make names up here, but Caicedo and Kim Min Jae, Costa and Vlahovic up front, then it's part of a very good summer. But uh, yeah, I get where you're coming from. But remember, these same, listen, the same people that don't want Mount said Donny van der Beek will ball out under this manager and is clear. They say clear of Bruno Fernandes. So that's why it's hard for me to take their hyperbolic, polarized opinion seriously anymore because they, they say that their ID is better, but they literally think Donny van der Beek is KDB. And it, it blows my mind. Not in the Premier League anyway. He might be in the Eredivisie. He's certainly yeah. not uh, when it comes to Premier League football. But thank you for the super chat. I really do uh, appreciate that, bro. Obviously, the other big news that has broke today, um, and there's been some more since we've been live, actually. Uh, Jacob Steinbeck has said that Manchester... Steinberg, sorry. Has said that Manchester City are ready to blow Arsenal out of the water for Declan Rice. But what we do know is that Declan Rice has had a bid. Uh, Arsenal have submitted a, 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 a bid for Declan Rice around £80 million. Reports say that's been rejected. But City and Pep are now entering the race, according to the mainstream media. Uh, what's your understanding of, of the bid, first of all, from Arsenal, the rejection? Um, and then obviously we'll move into sort of City entering this race as well. Yeah, so this has kind of always been my stance. Um, Arsenal always been pole position. This has always been their situation to control. And it was all going to depend on how the first bid went on what other opportunities would open up. And, and Man City was always the potential for a hijack. Um, I actually don't think there's much wrong with the numbers that are being talked about here for, for Arsenal's bid. Um, I think 80 million plus 10. So you look at a 90 million pound offer for Declan Rice. I think that that is actually decent for a first offer. This isn't like Chelsea. And this isn't like Arsenal going in and saying, okay, so it's, 50 and 20 and 10 and 10 like this this is actually quite a clear um plan and i think it's i think it's fine in that sense it's the structure and it probably isn't all right and it's also the fact that west ham ideally want a hundred million pounds from this so i'm still not far off i think that's what we should consider here so i don't think that this is this is done for arsenal like so much has gone in to declan rice understanding what arsenal were about and being won over by that, that there's no way he's just going to turn his his attention away from this now, um, just because West Ham haven't accepted the opening offer. It's very normal for an opening offer to be rebuffed, and it's very normal for a club to go in with their opening offer to be below what they're actually willing to go to. So to go in at basically £90 million, I think, shows good intent. The problem is Man City. Like, it's always been the elephant in the room, and I... I mentioned this a few times in the last week. Um, I wrote about it um, a couple of days ago on our Patreon page at, at Ranks FC that there's the potential for a, for a rice hijack from Man City. They'd had their eye on it. They'd inquired about it um, and inquired personally as to whether he'd be interested and what he'd be looking at. The way I understand this now is that if Declan Rice had assurances that Pep Guardiola was going to be there because <laughs> I think that is imp that that is still important. I know that Man City have like made noises to say that like he is going to be there for the next two years. I think ideally Rice would want to know that he was there for longer than two years. But anyway, as long as he's there for the next two years, then Declan Rice is interested in this. Of course he is. You've got the treble winners, the Champions League winners. You've got Pep Guardiola. You've got Erling Haaland. You've got Jack Grealish. Like there's a lot here that would suit Declan Rice. Yes, he would rather stay in London, but there's it's never been the case that he will not move to one of the Manchester clubs because he's from London. That that's not the case. Like yeah, he's got a, he's got a really big family down there. They've got a good base. They're a really really tight unit. Like that is all true. But Manchester's not that far away and he's like a professional who's trying to get to the top of his game. He's got the chance to go to Manchester City. He's going to seriously consider it. As I say, I've always said, like, Arsenal's chances of getting um, rise coming into this transfer window, like, they had, I, I was said it as high as, like, 75 80% that Declan Rice yeah. was going to go to Arsenal. I've said that. But if it didn't happen, it was Man City who were always going to be that first team lined up to try and take the most, make the most of that opportunity to sign them. And that is really scary because if Man City this year go and sign Gavardiol and Declan Rice, we might as well all go home because, like, this... You can't compete with it. 
Like <laughs> that they would take this team to ridiculous levels. You throw in squad players like Kovacic as well, and yeah, whoever they sign as a left back. Guardi out into this team. Yeah, it's it, and everyone's panicking as oh, they lose silver. If they lose Gundogan, it's over. No, it's no. not. See, you're never going to be done. Yeah. Yeah, so so I think that's where we are. I mean, Arsenal will come back. This won't be the end of it. Um, it's amazing how quickly this story has moved on. I mean, the story has literally begun at like eight o'clock this morning about the rejected bid. And here we are at midday and it's already like he's going to Man City, like in four hours. Like that can't, these things don't happen like that. Um, this has been a, a build up. Man City have always been in the background. They've been waiting for that to see what happened with Arsenal because they knew it was going to happen. And they know that Arsenal are further down the line than them with these negotiations and that Rice is quite happy to go and join Arsenal. But yeah, they've always been that backup team. Like Bayern Munich, like that's just not an option. Like mm. there's a big difference between being willing to go to play in Manchester to there is to being go and play in Munich. Um, there, there hasn't been that lure for him to go um and play there like there's just something about it that just doesn't doesn't really fancy at this stage i'm told so there was no real there's no real chance that happened even if Tuchel did want it to yeah. so yeah um interesting to see if man united were to get involved too um it's obviously a lot of money and but they need a midfielder and and you know could they risk like falling further behind man city that that would be the other thing to now consider like do man united think hang on if this is actually becoming an open auction, then maybe we need to get involved in this. And Declan Rice, <laughs> this is a couple of months ago now, but I spoke to one of his friends. He's like, oh, mate, he loves Man United. Like, he um, he, he loves the idea, he would love the idea of like everything that Man United stands for. He said, so if it does open up, like, I would never rule out uh, Man United. So we'll wait and see. But again, the same people always, always have been Arsenal, Arsenal, Arsenal. So, it's a really, really fascinating situation that we've we've got opening up in front of us on day two at the transfer window. Um, it, it certainly is. I, my reading of it, looking at all the stories from, from Je February really through till now, is you know Rice has either agreed personal terms or they won't be a problem or he's favourable to them. You know me, uh, Dean. I don't really care about the phrase. He knows he's happy with what Arsenal are willing to offer him. He knows what they're going to offer him. He's probably happy with what City would offer him financially he's probably happy with what Chelsea and Man United would are offering financially but it does boil down to at the end of the day when you've got all those offers in front of you where is best for my career Do, would you say right now Arsenal are still leading the race if that's the right term for it yeah because Man City are only just entering the race and Arsenal are so far down the line that they have they're, they're still in front here um you know to them this is a a slight setback, but probably a setback that they expected. Like, that, I don't think that it's that common that you're opening bid for a deal of this size and you know it's quite open that West Ham won £100 million. I don't think they would have expected it to be, uh, you know, a foregone conclusion that they bid today and he joins tomorrow. But it, it's just it's just added a layer of, of doubt now um, to the whole thing. And, and this will run away now. This Man City a narrative will will get legs and just go. Um, and Arsenal will have to maintain their focus, be reassured that, and remind themselves that all along, Rice has been very happy to to become an Arsenal player and just hope that that remains the case. What Arsenal have got to do is be serious for a moment. And maybe, just maybe, this afternoon, offer £100 million, structure it, of course. Maybe it's 95 guaranteed. 5 million, maybe even more, 10 million, 15 million add-ons, whatever it may be. Go over 100 million, structure it, make a big bid, blow City out the water, get it done now, because the longer you sit in that water, the more chance Arsenal have got of the big blue shark coming up from behind and, and biting their legs off, maybe even yeah. gobbling them up completely. The longer they stay in that water, Jaws is coming. So what yeah. Arsenal got to do, 100 million, 110 million, whatever it costs, get the bid in this afternoon, get it done so that West Ham accept it, get Declan Rice to sign that paperwork, do his... I know he's on England duty, but that doesn't matter either. You can get the medicals done there. If he's, if he's with England, it means he's got doctors around him. Get the medicals done, get him signed up, get rid of, get rid of City, because City will not stop. They're, they are a machine when it comes to getting their targets. So they need to be very, very mindful. I, I believe what you've said. I think Arsenal are ahead. 
I think he's infused. I think all the things he said about, I want to come, I want to play for the manager. I don't think any of that is untrue. Mm -hmm. However, the longer City are there, the longer you're lounging about in that water, you've got a big, big chance of having your toes nibbled off. Yeah, I mean, I I think what you're saying there, there, there's definitely something in that. Um, When I I checked in with someone this morning on on this, I was like, what happens now with Arsenal? Um, And they said, they'd go back with a second offer very quickly. Like within 48 hours, you would like, you can expect Arsenal to be reevaluating this and going back in. And West Ham also, it's in their interest, we've got to remember, for this Man City narrative to now come out. Like Man City's inquiry has been there for a little while but it's not really been talked about publicly. It's been hinted at here and there, um, but it hasn't really been much to talk about. But now the first offer has gone in, it's become public, that man, more public, that Man City have this interest. Well, West Ham should be feeding that out because they want an auction. If they want £100 million and the open offer is 80 plus 10, well, that's not what they want. So push that out there, create a bit of fuss around it, make it believed that that can actually happen and Arsenal come back within yeah, 48 hours or so, and actually put that second off of the table and then things can actually start to fall into place. So, it, you know, you've, you've been doing this this show long enough to know no, the mechanics of how it works. 110%. It's West Ham that have been the ones to say, be rejected. West Ham that have said, Man City are circling. Of course it's them. And so I've said to a lot of um, yeah, Arsenal fans over the weeks, all the stories that make you feel worried as a gooner are coming from the side of West Ham because they want more money. You know, as it as it as, as it stands right now, they want yeah. more money. Equally, if Bernardo Silva and Ilka Gundogan both sign new deals today, the situation will change again because yeah. maybe just maybe they won't be in the in the market for a, a midfielder of that of that level. They might try and replace Calvin Phillips, but, yeah. but we'll see. And that that's why yeah. it's going to change. But Arsenal, get your business done. Get another huge yeah. bid in. Get out that water now. Like we all saw that video. We all saw that video on the Egyptian. Uh, coast the other day, God, uh, God rest his soul and rest in peace. I ain't going in the ocean no more. And Arsenal should follow suit and get out the goddamn sea. <laughs> get out the sea. It ain't a safe place. It ain't yeah. a safe place. There's sharks, there's jellyfish, there's the sea itself. It's a very de- get out the ocean. Human <laughs> beings shouldn't be in it ever. We should never That's be in it. Do you know what I mean? Ar- Listen, ask, ask Leonardo DiCaprio. He had a bad time in the sea. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's surprising though that Rose ain't found him. He's had all those movies since. Like they said, Jack was dead. Plenty of time. I've seen him on loads of films. He was he was in Wall Street for a while and everything. I love <laughs> uh, there we go. It's going to be an interesting one. In terms of Arsenal, what what else have they got going on? Timothy Castagna is, a, again, another player that's kind of triggered the Arsenal fan base they've been linked to. Um, any other deals that we should be aware of going on with the Gooners right now? Yeah, I mean, they're going to be a team that absolutely attacks the market um, this summer because they know that they're an unbelievable opportunity here to to make sure that they have leapfrogged all those teams that they overtook this season and they've, they've, you know, got a grip on the, um, on the league like they didn't expect. I mean, look, this is a bit, if you're an Arsenal fan, one of the reasons you'll be a bit nervous right now, you saw your team all season in a really strong position to win the Premier League title. You lost your grip um, and lost it right at the end. And now you're thinking, are we doing the same thing with Declan Rice? Our our top priority bloke, we've been told all this time we're going to get him and and now we're losing grip of that too. But don't panic too much because as I say, I think this was all part of the plan and they will be back very quickly, maybe even sooner than 24 hours. Um, Just trying to find, I've got notes here and I've got uh, for Arsenal's transfer targets because I've just literally written about it yesterday. Um, Yeah, so centre-back, they are looking at one of the key things to consider um, in Arsenal's recruitment this this summer is that they want to make sure that this team cannot be bullied, okay? Because they feel that like that is something that is could potentially come up against this. Technically, this team is absolutely brilliant, right? They are they can out football most most teams, but what they'll come up against next season is more physicality. They'll have teams trying different tactics against them to try to make sure that they can't play this controlling game that they that they like. And as a result of that, you'll see probably um, in terms of the centre-back, possibly the right-back, the right-back might be a bit different, and a central midfielder who have really physical traits. So um, that is something to look out for. In terms of targets, they are... They do really like Gehi at Crystal Palace, who's obviously on international duty with England at the moment. Um, could be a difficult get because they're not the only team interested in him and Palace definitely ain't going to let him go cheap. So I think that'll be a, a tough one. But outside of that, there's a couple um, that they're looking at in Germany. 
uh, Tapsaba uh, at Leverkusen, um, Simakan, who's been linked quite a bit too. Like they, they're all kind of uh, being pro. They've all been profiled, and, and they're kind of going to wait to decide who they go for in that position. I mean, talk about Mason Mount. They've they've liked Mason Mount a long time. They just felt he wasn't going to be gettable. Caicedo, they they still like. Um, small chance that they get involved in that. Do they go for Jao Cancelo? Possibly. I mean, if you know, we're talking before early in the show about where Arsenal and Chelsea are at in terms of their recruiting. Chelsea is all about the future. Arsenal's is looking more like it's the here and now. If Chelsea, if if Arsenal's strategy is to go for players like Declan Rice, Caicedo, um, and Jao Cancelo, like that is a massive improvement immediately the second they come in through the door at training. Um, and would set really, really set the bar for this team, make an even bigger push for things next season. Yeah, it's 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 certainly going to be it's certainly going to be uh, an an, inter- an interesting summer uh, for them. There's no doubt about it. A lot of people talking here. Uh, Kim to Bayern. Yeah, we've seen that news. Um, Fabrizio has said that Bayern Munich look like the favourites now for Kim. Man United and Newcastle are still in the race, but Bayern have now now have a concrete chance. Kim has a release clause, just about convincing the player. Yeah, and listen, it's it's up as we do. We, we'll always report on on the stories. It's fine. I, it's funny, Luke, and I say say it's the dean as well. I'll report to d- today because Fabrizio says Bayern are the favourites. Tomorrow, another journalist will say United are the favourites and we'll talk about it. And I'll get it in the net. I'll tell you, yesterday you said it was Bayern. I never say it was anything. I just talk about what the journalists have said. I'm actually surprised after like 10 years of fan content, the fan <laughs> media, still people on, like I, I say this all the time about No Salt, Goldbridge, AFTV, True Geordie, they're the goats of this. They're the biggest people. Expressions, the terrace. DR Sports, none of us have any sources. We just talk to journalists and then we repeat what journalists tell us. And you might speak to four different journalists and get four different answers. It's not on us. Like that isn't on us. Our job is to say what we I always say it like this. When I was a kid or young, I weren't in the pub doing this. You'd be in the pub with your mates when I was a young man. You read a story in the back of the paper and go, look what this one says. Somebody else must say, oh, I read differently in the Daily Mail. We didn't fight each other over, over what the different newspapers said. We just had a debate and a conversation about it. I don't know where, but it's like online now. Obviously, we've quote tweeted what you've said, that Declan Rice is interested in interested in the mo- joint, potentially joining City. It's been met with, Terry, why are you pushing fake news? It's like, it's not fake news. It, it is what it is. But people get what yeah. it is. People get angry because it isn't. He'll reject. Yeah, it. like he's the, the likelihood. Right, I see someone in the in the chat just said about um, you know, Eddie had weeks to to tie up uh, Rice, and now now City have got him. City haven't got Declan Rice. Declan Rice is still set up to go to to Arsenal. Like that hasn't changed. All that's happened is there's been a first bid that's been rejected, and they'll come back with a second bid, and it will. The chances are that will be enough to satisfy West Ham. Like we don't know what that offer is going to be yet, but. Man City have always been in the background. And if Man City are there in the background, you can't ignore it as a footballer. You just can't. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it would, it would be irresponsible just to, for Dean to sit here and say, there's no interest in City. Arsenal fans, relax. Nothing's going to happen. Imagine then he joins City. <laughs> mm-hmm. They'd be like, Dean lied to us. You can't. Like D- Dean hasn't said that he's definitely joining City. He <laughs> said that Arsenal are still leading the race as of right now, but the Arsenal have got to get the business done because City seem like they might be. Let's serious. see where we are. Look, by the end of the yeah. day, that second bid might have gone in. Like, let, let's wait and see. I mean, this the story's moved on loads in four hours, so like a, another eight hours. Who knows what would be? Uh, Arsenal are not serious. Sorry, Arsenal are not serious. Season after season, they play this game and they end up. Uh, sorry, and the end result, players go elsewhere. Now I get that fear. I get that fear. That's why I said what I said. Uh, speaking facts here, says uh, Terry, uh, you're fully back in this Mount deal because he's English and you're not getting what people are saying that Mount isn't a holding midfielder, uh, which should be the target for Man United this summer. So his nationality has nothing. I've said this to you before, speaking facts. This is your last warning. You ever mention that I have a bias based on people's nationalities again, I will ban you from the football terrace. Because one, my favourite player is Bruno Fernandes. And the last time I checked, he doesn't have a british passport as far as i'm aware my one of my next favorite players is is, is martinez I, dean martinez english or is he Argentine? i wish he was english mate yeah i wish he was english <laughs> that the case at all equally i agree that we need a holding midfield player i agree with that logic and that's why i literally said in my statement speaking facts and you're speaking absolute truffle is mason mount would be a great signing if it was part or good signing if it was part of a great summer which included like i said a player like Caicedo. So in your 
the second half of your statement, if you actually listened, instead of being so angry at me, but maybe because I live a life that you wish you could, maybe you wish you were me, maybe you want to hold my hand and give me a kiss and a cuddle, I don't know. If you actually listened to what I said, the second half of your statement wouldn't have existed, and it has nothing to do with his nationality, because go back and watch the videos when we were linked to him, I am not overly happy about it. But the next time you make a claim on the terrorist that I have biases based on passports, you will be banned from this platform for life because that is not what I do in any way, any shape or any form in any aspect of my life. So stop the bullshit, stop the nonsense and challenge what I say rather than making up lies, you silly little boy. Either that or go back on to mummy's bitty. One of the two things you've got to go and do now, my friend. Jesus Christ. Like it, it, this guy literally all the time. I also want Mason. I also want Maguire and McTominay out of the club because I don't think they're good enough. <laughs> Last time I checked, I swear man had British passport, you know. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> the lies these people come out with is crazy. Um, oh dear. It's crazy to me, but there we go. Dean, always a pleasure to speak to Transfer with you. I'm sure That's we'll fun. have you back on uh, next Thursday about around about 11 o'clock to go. F- Listen, in the next week, who knows what happens by the end of next week. Man United, have you seen the stock price of Man United again, by the way? Down. Three days running, growing, stabilizing, and growing every day. Which I've been, I've been, I've been ringing all my friends back in the bank. Going, what do you make of this? What do you make? Of this? <laughs> because the last two times they said that it looks like it's going to be Radcliffe, stock price drops. So I'm open. I'm open. I'm open. It's them Qataris, but we'll see. Uh, Dean, we'll all, always yep. a pleasure. Viewers, please hit the like button before you leave. Until next time, take care. Goodbye. God bless, and we'll see you all again very.